Uh, thanks for the introduction, Daniel, and uh, thank you all for attending. I really wasn't expecting uh, this turnout, so that's great. Um, so yeah, as Daniel uh, said, so my research currently here at UNR um, has to do with looking at uh, color processing in the color anom anomalous brain. Um, and firstly, before I go into all that, just a brief outline of the talk. So I'll be giving a very brief overview as to what color is, how we perceive it, how we process it, as well as uh, what um, anomalous trichromacy is. And uh, this is a particular type of color blindness. And then after giving that background, I'll be going into some of the projects that I'm currently working on. And I've been a bit ambitious for this 30 minute talk to discuss all of these projects. So I'll be giving a very broad brushstroke of each one. And so of, um, I guess the first project I'll be talking about has to do with like looking at uh, chromatic contrast responses in early visual cortex, so the part of the brain that deals with perception and vision. So looking at these responses and comparing them between color normals and anomalous trichromats. And so this is a completed project. And then afterwards, I'm gonna be talking about the remaining projects, which are all currently in the works. So I do wanna preface that um, they're all in the planning stages and I'm currently piloting um, these experiments. So if there's anything you see, anything glaringly obvious that I should be doing or I'm doing wrong, please do let me know at the end. There'll be 30 minutes of questions. So the second project that I'll be talking about is just a follow-up of the first, whereby we'll be looking at uh, luminance responses in people with anomalous trichromacy. And then the third project is a follow-up of the previous two, whereby we're doing a, a layered approach, whereby we're looking at these chromatic contrast responses across different layers of cortex using high resolution imaging in collaboration with people over at the University of Minnesota. And then the fourth project will be looking at um, color representation in the brain. So the former three projects are just looking at overall magnitude differences in brain activity um, between color normals and anomalous trichromats. But it really doesn't give you an idea of how color is actually represented in the brain. And so in order to do that, you need to do a different type of analysis known as um, pattern analysis, whereby you look at the correlation between activity of say different objects that have different colors, like a red apple or a, a yellow banana, or you look at differences in activation to different cues themselves, like red, blue, and green. And so there's a lot to get through, so I'll just jump into the background now. So what is color? So at least color to us, um, we just see part of the electromagnetic spectrum the visible part, which is between 380 and 750 nanometers. And so anything beyond this range is in the infrared and in anything below this range is in the ultraviolet. And basically the light coming from the sun mostly is within this visible range. And um, basically shorter wavelengths are represented, at least to us, as uh, purplish bluish hues. And anything that's higher is represented to us as reddish hues. And in terms of how we perceive these different colors, it's really all got to do with the receptors that are located at the back of the eye, specifically in the retina. So within the retina, we have all sorts of different receptors, but the ones I'll mainly be talking about today are the cones. So the three different types of cones, S, M, and L. Uh, there are also rods and IPRGCs back there, um, and they have been implicated in color processing, but I won't be talking about them today. So in terms of these three different types of cones, so they have three different types of sensitivities. And so they're each um, basically centered on a different um, wavelength. So the S cone, as you would probably imagine, is sensitive to short wavelengths. And so it peaks around here. And then the M cone is sensitive to medium wavelengths, so it's sensitive around here. And then the L, even longer wavelengths. And so the way in which we see color really is just a combination of activity across the three of these receptors. And so it's sort of analogous to a printer with three different ink guns. So you can combine the three and generate a whole gamut of colors. And similar to monitors that have uh, different guns for so the RGB and combined together, you can see many different colors. And so basically to give an example of how we would perceive certain hues. And so for instance, if I were to center on a purplish hue, you can see that it activates these three different cones differently. And so you can see there's a lot of activation happening for this S cone, a little bit of activation happening for the M cone, and not very much for the, the L cone. And so if I were to plot sort of in a cartoony way, the activation between these three cones, you get something like this. And you can think of it as the sort of perceptual signature for the, the purple hue here. 
And so to give you another example of um, how we would perceive a different hue, so say um, a yellowish hue, you can see that there's a lot of activation happening across the L cone, not very much for the M cone, and then very little for the S cone, if any at all. And so basically you get this sort of perceptual signature, which to us gives us this sort of perception of yellow. And so really this is just to stress again that it's really not just one cone that's coding blue, for instance, or one cone coding red. It's really just the combination of the activation across these three cones that give rise to our perception of color. And so what were to happen if um, there was some sort of deficit in these uh, cones, say one is shifted and there's more overlap between the two. So when this happens, um, you have a condition known as anomalous trichromacy, which is a genetic mutation which changes the peak sensitivity of either the M cone, so the M cone shifted to the right, this is known as pseudo anomaly, or the L cone is shifted to the left, and this is known as proto anomaly. And so since this is a genetic condition that's carried on the X chromosome, uh, this affects males more so than uh, females, where about 6% of male population has anomalous trichromacy, and only about 0.4% of females have anomalous tri trichromacy. And so on the right here, I have uh, simulations of what an image may look like if you had one of these particular uh, types of anomalous trichromacy. And on the bottom, I've also got um, plots of their cone sensitivities. And so this is what a color normal would be. And in the middle here, this is what a person with a deuter anomalous condition would be. And so you can see that um, the red is less vibrant and it becomes a bit dim and it's a bit harder to differentiate between red and green. And this is all due to the overlap between these two different cone types. So the dashed line is uh, the M cone of the color normal. And you can see the solid line, which is shifted slightly to the right, now is overlapping more with the L cone. And due to this overlap, it's a bit harder to differentiate between uh, red and green colors. And so um, it's very similar for a proto-anomaly, except uh, the L cone is shifted to the left. So the dashed line again is a normal L cone. And for someone with proto-anomaly, you can see that now it's been shifted to the left and has a lot of overlap with the M cone. And this is the sort of percept you would get. And so uh, the difference between red and green is a bit harder to discern. And so to give you a better idea of, I guess, how these activations manifest in these sorts of conditions. So again, I've got the cone sensitivities for a color normal. And I'm going to flick to the cone sensitivities of someone with a, a deuter anomaly. And so you can see here, it's very subtle. I'm flicking between the two, but there's a very slight shift to the right that causes a bit more overlap between the two cones. And so to give the examples again of a purple hue, so for a color normal on the left, you can see that there's activation happening across the three of these cones and you get this sort of what I call a perceptual signature of purple. But in the case of someone with a, a deuter anomaly, you can see that now due to this shift, um, there's a lot more overlap happening in this sort of region between the M and the L cone. And so you're getting very similar activations here for M and L. And so for this particular person, if they're trying to differentiate whether or not this is a purple hue or not, it might be a bit more difficult since the activation between M and L are essentially the same. And so they might confuse it between a blue hue instead. And um, in the case of yellow, so again, um, for a color normal, there's a massive difference between the activation of the L M cone and the L cone. But uh, the difference in um, activation between M and L for someone with a, a deuter anomaly you can see it's actually smaller. And so it is still there, but you, you may, this person may say it's yellow or they may say it's yellowish green. It's just a bit harder to discern what the color actually is. And so as you can probably imagine, um, having this overlap between the M and the L cone is of course gonna make it harder to discriminate different colors, particularly red and green. And this has been shown in numerous behavioral experiments. So for instance, this is, um, these are detection thresholds that were collected from uh, one of our studies. And on the y-axis, we have um, threshold. And on the x-axis, we have the different uh, subjects. But basically, this was a task done to look at how much contrast is needed to perceive a red and green image or a red and green grading. And as you can see, all the controls are tightly clustered on the bottom here, but they don't need very much contrast to see red and green at all. But when you look at the anomalous participants, which are the red dot here, you can see that they're elevated, meaning that they need a lot more contrast in order to see these red and green images. And so this really goes to show that um, there is some sort of difficulty in discriminating these colors, 
But what's interesting is that there are a whole range of tasks in which they actually don't show too much of a deficit if you were to simply base your predictions on their cone sensitivities. And in some cases, they actually perform a lot better than controls. And so the one instance of this that we've seen in um, the literature is a study done by Doron back, on, back in 2019. And basically what they did was look at um, contrast sensitivity between anomalous trichromats and um, control participants. And so on the y-axis, we have contrast sensitivity. And then the two different bars for the two different uh, participant groups. So the red is the anomalous trichromat, and the control um, is in blue. And they did this um, for this plot at six cycles per degree and nine cycles per degree. And basically, what you can see is that there's a significant um, difference between the two groups, whereby anomalous trichromats are actually performing a lot better than controls. And so this is sort of an inkling that perhaps there's something going on in order to compensate for these uh, receptor sensitivity losses. And so there was actually another experiment conducted um, looking at different tasks to see whether or not um, anomalous trichromats actually perform better depending on the task. And this was a study done by Vanston back in um, 2020. And basically what they first did was a detection threshold task. And this is similar to this experiment we conducted here on the left. And you can see that um, they needed a lot more contrast in, in order to see a red and green grading. But when they perform the same task, differentiating between colors at super contrast level, so when the contrast was high enough for them to actually see the colors, they could quite easily discriminate between different colors of red and green. Um, so this is an inkling again, that there must be something going on, at least in certain tasks, that's enabling them to perform much better than you would expect just based on their cone sensitivities. And then the final example I'll show you here today was a study looking at um, basically how color is represented in the brain using a behavioral task. And so they used a method known as multidimensional scaling to look at the relative distance in how color is perceived in different groups. So they studied uh, color normals, people with a uh, deuter anomaly and people with a uh, proton anomaly. And basically, if we just focus on um, the normal, this is the sort of distribution you would expect. Um, so it's a circular uh, representation of these colors and they're spaced out accordingly. And this sort of representation was also circular in people that were deuter anomalous and protonomalous, um, which wasn't expected. And so their gamut of colors was actually expanded because when they ran um, simulations of what these circles should look like in uh, people with uh, anomalous trichromacy, you actually get these really squished ellipses. Um, and these uh, were just predictions based on their cone sensitivities. So something's going on whereby they're somehow accounting for this uh, receptor sensitivity loss. And um, what may be going on is something that's happening at the level of the brain. So this is just an example here. So if you're just processing yellow based on this sort of cone makeup in deuter anomaly, you have this um, sort of small difference between activation of the M and the L cone. But that difference is still there, it's just the signal is a bit weaker. And so what perhaps may be going on is at the level of the brain, when the signal goes from the retina to the part of the brain that processes vision, perhaps it's sort of like an amplifier connected to a speaker whereby you can turn up the volume. And in that way, you can sort of just increase the difference at the cortical level and enable you to sort of maximize that signal and better see whatever color. But in the instance where these two curves are too close together, if you try to amplify that, that signal, you're not really going to get much out because the difference isn't big enough. And so only in certain situations would you be able to amplify this signal in order to increase your color gamut. So the studies I showed you before that sort of suggestive of this compensation, um, so far, most of them have just been done behaviorally. And, um, the locus of this compensation is expected to be at the level of the brain. But at the moment, there haven't actually been too many studies that have measured neural responses to um, chromatic gradings or colors, at least in anomalous trichromats. And so um, as part of my set of projects, we aim to fill in this gap in order to, in order to characterize and figure out whether or not amplification is actually happening at the level of cortex. And so this brings me to the first project I'll be talking about today, which um, looked at um, measuring chromatic contrast responses in early visual cortex in both uh, color normals and um, people with anomalous trichromacy. And so I was quite fortunate to be able to work on this project. So 
Um, I actually started my postdoc posi position here at UNR in March 2020, which was unfortunate timing since everything shut down. So we weren't actually able to run any experiments, but I was quite lucky because a former um, member of the lab, Katie Tregolis, um, she had a data set um, that we were able to work on and process together uh, during the lockdown. And so we found some quite interesting results um, from this analysis. But essentially what she did when she ran the study was um, get people into an MRI scanner with um, color normals and anomalous trichromats, and she presented these uh, gradings, uh, red, green, and blue, yellow at different contrast levels. And um, basically in the fMRI world or in the literature, um, changing the contrast of the stimulus is fairly well documented. And basically, if you increase the contrast of an image, you increase brain activity. And this is a fairly well modeled um, uh, phenomena. And so we try to utilize this design to look for amplification in the color anomalous brain. But uh, before I go into the results, um, just for those of you who aren't too familiar with fMRI, so it stands for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. And basically, in an, in an experimental setup, we get the, the, the participant to lay down in the scanner and they're holding um, button boxes to respond. And so if their task is to look at the center of the screen and press a button when the color changes, they can do so using those buttons. And then um, we put a head coil on them in order to measure their brain activity. And then usually on top of this coil, there's a mirror that's pointing to the, the back of the scanner. And so when they get wheeled in um, behind them, there's a screen. And on that screen, we present the stimuli whilst we're measuring their brain activity. And so the signal in which we're actually measuring is just based on the assumption really that um, neurons need energy to fire. And in order to provide that energy, blood flow needs to go to that area of the brain to provide um, oxygen. And so presumably since we're showing visual stimuli, there's gonna be a lot of blood flow to the back of the head. And basically that blood flow um, comes with oxygenated blood. And when the neurons uptake the oxygen, um, the, the blood turns into deoxygenated de blood. And basically that difference between oxygenation has a very small difference in its magnetic properties. And basically using an MRI scanner, which is basically just a big magnet, you can pick up on these small differences in the magnetic change. And this is our indirect measure of brain activity. And I do stress that it is indirect, but um, it is much better than sticking electrodes um, into your head. Um, so that's how MRI works. And in terms of um, how we actually uh, measure activity and what um, areas we're interested in, so we're interested in the back of the head, which is early visual cortex, and that part of the brain processes perception and vision. And so just as a schematic, so you have light entering the eye, that goes to the LGN, which is in the middle of the brain. And then all that information gets projected to V1, and then that gets projected to V2, and then to V3. And so we're primarily interested in these three areas uh, for the study I'm talking about right now. All right, so here are the results. Um, so on the y-axis, we've got brain activity, which is um, demarked by beta weight. So beta weight is just a model of the brain activity. So the higher the beta weight, the higher the brain activity. And on the x-axis, we have the different contrast levels on the left, low, to the right, high. And then we've got the red, green grading responses here, blue, yellow here. And um, the gray lines are the color normals and the colored lines are the anomalous trichromats. And each column is a different brain area, V1 to V3. So as you can probably immediately notice, uh, the curves are different in V1 between the, the color normals and the anomalous trichromats. But in V2 and V3, there is no significant difference between the two. And so this is indicative of some sort of amplification happening, at least at um, the stage of V2. And then in V1, um, we've got this dash line here, which is our modeled response based on um, the responses of just based on their, uh, sorry, cone receptor sensitivities. So if we just base responses on that, you can see that uh, the responses in V1 line up with the cone receptor sensitivities um, and there was no significant difference here. So it really seems like amplification is happening at the stage of uh, V2. And um, in terms of the blue yellow gradings, um, we just included that as a control measure because there shouldn't have been any, di any difference between the two groups. And um, that's exactly what we found, no significant difference between uh, controls and anomalous trichomats. And so, so the first experiment in this project, um, we just had a simple fixation task. Um, 
And so we wanted to run a follow-up just in case um, participants were actually paying attention to the, the gradings, because it's possible if you're an anomalous trichromat and you're aware that you have some sort of color deficiency, you might have some sort of behavioral ways to compensate for that by perhaps paying more attention. And so we ran a follow-up experiment um, whereby we had a high attention fixation task to make sure that they weren't attending to the stimuli, but essentially we found the same uh, finding whereby B1, there isn't much amplification or compensation going on, it's all happening in B2 and B3. And so this is the first study so far to show at least at the neural level that there is some sort of compensation going on in anomalous trichomers. And so as a follow-up to that, we wanted to figure out whether or not there was also some sort of amplification happening in terms of luminance processing. And so for this project, um, as I said before, we wanted to see if the amplification extends to luminance processing because at least um, the way we talk about it in uh, vision research, uh, luminance is really just a combination between L and M signals. And so to give you an idea of what they may, uh, what that may represent in an image, so I've got an original image here. And if I, were, if I were to just pull out the luminance component, which is L plus M, you basically just get this grayscale image here. And if you were to pull out just uh, the red green component, so L minus M, it would look something like this. And if you were to pull out just the blue yellow component, you'd get something like this. And so since we were seeing amplification happening for the red green grading, um, in the previous experiment, um, basically that's showing that there's some sort of amplification happening between the L and M signal. And so since luminance is a combination between these two signals, perhaps you would see higher responses in anomalous trichromats compared to controls if they were just um, viewing black and white luminance gradings. And there's already some sort of evidence for that, at least what I showed you before when looking at contrast sensitivity, whereby anomalous trichromats actually have higher con contrast sensitivity compared to controls. And perhaps this is manifest at the level of um, early visual cortex. And so in terms of where we're at with this project, um, so we're still in the middle of data collection. And so far we've collected um, data on four out of five controls, but only two out of five anomalous trichromats. Um, our main hold up here is that it's really hard to recruit anomalous trichromats. So um, if you or anyone you know happens to be an anomalous trichromat, you know, uh, please let me know if you're interested in having their brain scanned. Um, but anyway, the only difference between the last experiment that I talked about and this one is, again, that we just added uh, this extra set of stimuli, so luminous, grading range, luminous gradings ranging from 10 to 80% contrast. And so unfortunately, I'm still in the middle of processing the data, so I can't show you any pretty plots, but um, if I were to just make a prediction about what we may see based on um, the plots from the previous experiment, we may predict higher responses to luminous gradings in B2 and B3, if indeed this is where the ampli amplification is happening, and these um, responses should be higher for anomalous trichromats compared to controls. And it's also possible that responses to these gradings may saturate earlier in anomalous trichromats, but um, I need to process the data to figure out whether or not that's actually the case. Okay, so that was the second project. Um, and so the third project that we're currently in the middle of um, getting started is um, based on the previous two, but now we're just um, trying to use higher, higher resolution fMRI to figure out the cortical locus of this amplification in anomalous trichromats. And so basically what I was saying before is that it, it appears that this heightened response in um, people with anomalous trichromacy is beginning in B2, but we're not actually sure because it may actually be happening in B1 or between B1 and B2. And the reason I say that is because the resolution in which we captured data, data is um, was at three mils, which is fairly standard for fMRI research. But by doing this, we're essentially averaging responses across all the different cortical layers of B1. And the reason that this may be a problem is because information from the LGN into B1 first starts in this input layer, layer 4C, and perhaps within this layer, there isn't any amplification going on, but perhaps in the output layer, when it finally moves from 4C to 2,3, perhaps within this layer, there's some sort of post-receptoral neural gain going on. But since we have three millimeter resolution, we're essentially just averaging across these layers, so we can't really resolve that. 
And if indeed responses are lower across this layer because it's the input layer, it's going to bring down the average. And so perhaps that's what's going on. But um, in order to resolve whether or not that's the case, we need to use a scanner that has higher resolution. And so we've written up a grant to work with um, collaborators over at um, the University of Minnesota. And we're quite fortunate because we managed to get funding. Um, but for this experiment, we can utilize a seven Tesla machine with higher resolution in order to scan at a resolution of 0.8. And when you're able to do this, you can actually start to resolve differences across different cortical layers. And so from this, we can look at responses, hey, just from, you know, layer 4C, or we can look at our responses in the higher layers, which may have some sort of post receptoral gain going on. And so we hope to work with our collaborators um, that uh, published this really nice paper last year, so Karen Navarro and Cheryl Ullman. And we plan on using their paradigm um, where they have this really nice analysis pipeline where they're able to look at responses in V1 across different cortical layers. And um, these were the stimuli that they used in their experiment. So this was their chromatic stimulus and their achromatic stimulus. And they were just looking at how responses differed to these two different stimulus types across the layers. And so on the y-axis, I've got um, the responses going from the white matter to the top of the gray matter. So you can think of it as a uh, layer one to layer six. And this is for the chromatic rating, and this is for the achromatic rating. And then on the, the x-axis, we have percent signal change. So to the right would be a higher response. And you can see just by the pattern of these three different lines that there appears to be different processing signatures between chromatic and achromatic ratings across the layers. And so we hope to use this paradigm on um, people that have anomalous trichromacy to see if there are any differences in the processing to chromatic stimuli across these different layers. But um, again, we're still just trying to get this experiment off the ground and we'll probably start sometime next year. So if you have any um, advice on what else we should look for in this um, experiment, please do let me know. All right, so that's um, the three sets of experiments I've explained now. And so now I'm going on to the fourth project whereby we're looking at um, color representation in the brain, uh, sensory versus perceptual representations. And so, as I mentioned at the very start of this talk, um, these three projects that I talked about earlier, were really just looking at overall magnitude differences in uh, brain activity between these two groups of participants using uh, color grading. And so while you can actually tackle the question of whether or not amplification is happening to the bold response, what you can't actually, actually answer or speak to is how exactly color is represented in the brain. And so in order to do that, you need to use different analysis techniques such as um, pattern analysis in order to test this. And so in order to run this project, we were thinking about ways in which we could you know, figure out how exactly color is represented in the brain of a color anom anomalous participant. And we came across this paper through a journal club um, and were inspired by their paradigm. And so the paper was by um, Wang and colleagues. And in their paper, they were actually looking at how color was represented in people that were blind from birth and just people that respited. And so their goal was to understand how sensory independent color knowledge is represented by comparing, as I said, these two groups, early blind to sighted participants. And in order to analyze um, the results to gauge this representation in the brain, they used a, an analysis technique called representational similarity analysis. And so for this, instead of looking at the overall magnitude of the response, Instead, you're looking at the pattern of responses in the brain. And so this analysis technique um, was um, brought forth by Nico Grigas Corte back in uh, 2008. And basically what you do in this um, analysis paradigm or technique, whatever you want to call it, is basically just compare activity between different sets of stimuli. So for instance, if I were to present this face to someone in the scanner and I presented this face again, you could look at the correlation of the pattern of activity between these two different trials. And presumably, since it's the, the same stimulus, the same face, you would get a one-to-one -one correlation between the pattern of activity. But say, for instance, you're in part of the brain that is um, sensitive to faces, and then you show a different sort of face. Well, it's still a face, but the face is slightly different. So you would reasonably get a lower correlation between um, these two particular stimuli. 
But if you were to show something completely different, like a house, and you compared the pattern of activity between the face and the house, you would um, presumably get a lower uh, correlation. And so this is known as um, RSA or representational similarity analysis. And this was the main basis of um, their analysis techniques. All right, so in terms of what they did for their experiment, so they first ran a behavioral um, test on their early blind and sighted controlled participants. And they basically just got each um, participant to rate the similarity of different um, fruits and vegetables that had different colors. And so you can see that a cherry is fairly similar to a strawberry and fairly similar to an apple, but then starts to drop off when you compare it to an orange. And what's remarkable is that when you just look at the overall pattern between sighted controls and early blind is that while it's slightly different, the overall pattern is the same. And indeed, if you just correlate these two matrices, you can see that the correlation is uh, 0.8. And so basically what this shows is that um, color representations in the brain, you don't really need to have any sensory information you can just learn it through language associations. So for instance, roses are red, violets are blue, apples are red, uh, bananas are yellow. So simply from that, you can get a pretty good um, representation of color out there in the world, even if you're blind. All right, so they did this um, behaviorally, but then they also wanted to do um, um, an fMRI experiment to see how these representations uh, manifest in the brain. And so for their paradigm, they had an auditory one whereby they just um, had a little speaker um, saying the names of all the vegetables, fruits and vegetables that they had in their behavioral paradigm and got participants to rate whether or not the object was red or not. And so this was done across both sighted and um, early blind participants. And then for the sighted participants, they wanted to find um, a sensory area that was just um, unique to processing color. And so they had this uh, color localizer task um, where they just presented colors and contrasted that with achromatic versions of those same images. And so what they found across both participants was that there appears to be this place in the brain or area of the brain, sorry, um, that is common across both early blind and sighted controls. And so this area of the brain was more frontal, uh, specifically in the temporal lobe, as well as uh, an area in the prefrontal cortex. And really what this is showing is that there's a particular area that's um, common across these two groups and suggests that um, you can have a place in the brain that just represents colors conceptually. And so this area that has been um, noted here has been implicated in language. So it seems like in this language area, there is this representation of colors out there in the world. But in terms of um, the sensory task where they were trying to look for a sensory area of the brain that just deals with color representations, they found um, this area at the back of the head, which is part of um, visual cortex. And um, this area dealt with um, color representations in a sensory manner. And so what they concluded from this was that there are two sections or streams in the brain, one that's sensory and one that's um, conceptual that deals with these color representations. And so we thought this was a very neat paradigm. And um, we thought it would be interesting to try to replicate this study, um, looking at um, how anomalous trichromats represent color in the brain. And so what's nice about um, using anom anomalous trichromacy in this case is that it's an intermediate model between sighted and um, early blinds since there's just one shift in a, a tone receptor but the sensory information is slightly different and so you can look at at which point does the representation differ and then at what point does it become the same so we thought it would be an interesting way to study this um, but again we're just at the beginning stages um, we actually were able to get a grant um, looking at this idea but um, yeah if you have any uh, suggestions or recommendations of what else we can look at um, using this approach, um, please do let me know. All right, so I've gone through all of these projects as well as the background um, really quickly. Hopefully you picked up on what I was doing, but um, to conclude, um, so basically what I've shown is that anomalous trichromats see a much wider gamut of colors than you would predict based on their cone sensitivities. And this may be due to some sort of amplification happening at the level of cortex. And we, sh we have shown this in our um, in the first project that I presented today. And um, we're still in the middle of planning and collecting data for these follow-up experiments that I um, just presented to you. But our main hurdle at the moment is really just 
finding participants. And so again, if you or someone you know in Reno has a color deficiency, um, please reach out to participate if you're interested. And um, just to uh, sum up, I wanted to show this picture from um, uh, Mike Webster's paper back in 2010, showing um, the degree of compensation that you may get if you were to model it through a lifetime of, um, of experience and um, compensation. So basically you've got this image here, which is what a color normal would see. And if you were to um, simulate what an anomalous striper map would see without any sort of compensation, this is the image that you would see. But if you take into account a lifetime's worth of compensation, accounting for these differences in the cones, you can see that um, the simulation is fairly close to what a color normal would see. And uh, what's interesting about this is, I guess studying um, this phenomenon in anomalous trichromats really is a window into the limits of plasticity because it's a very rare case in which you can actually study uh, compensation over such a long amount of time. So it really is quite an interesting um, condition to research. All right, so um, just before I finish everything up, I just want to thank um, everybody in the Webster lab. I also want to thank Katie Triglis for um, sharing that data set and working together on it with me as well as uh, Samantha Lee, who's um, worked hard with me on this uh, last project to get it off the ground. And um, yeah, thank, thank you all for listening. Um, I'm open to any questions.